Since the previous ban and restricted announcement got rid of two of the top dogs in the Pioneer format entirely, things have looked a little bit different. There have been some top tier decks that did not get affected that people have continued to play, but the Brewers and the Tournament Grinders, specifically around the upcoming regional championships, have been really trying to flex all of their creativity muscles, not the card itself, but all of their deck construction creativity muscles, trying to figure out the best deck to bring them to the Pro Tour. Now it's not an uncommon thing to see an aggro deck at top tiers of competitive play, like on the Pro Tour or taking over the metagame at RCs. However, it is a little less frequent that people, especially at their local metagame level, get excited about seeing aggro decks rise up in general. Now with both Amalia and Vayne Ripper just going kaputski out of the format a large amount of aggro decks have kind of cropped up after being kept down by the life drain and just the board wipe potential of those two specific decks most of them are going to be red based or in some cases mono red and they do have a plethora of different strategies such as going wide or going tall now there is one deck in particular that is kind of mishmashing a couple of our favorite aggro archetypes of formats past into one neat little package tied with a bow and thrown at our opponents. That's right, today we're going to be talking about the Rakdos flavor of aggro. It has prowess, it's got heroic, and it's got a whole plethora of mice that are going to be thrown at your opponent's face. Now the Rakdos Aggro deck just takes the moniker of aggro because it doesn't necessarily have one specific type of aggressive plan that it is looking to execute over the other. It does have a smaller amount of creatures compared to something like the Mono Red Wizards or the Boros Convoke decks that can go a little bit wider while still dealing some direct damage and then maybe even having some large curve toppers. It doesn't necessarily overlap with the Wizards deck in the style that every single card is going to want to synergize with casting instants and sorceries and having that prowess theme to make them get all bigger. And it's not going to have the same heroic style where we're just kind of Voltroning one creature and hoping that that one giant thing stays protected and is able to punch through all of the damage on our opponent. Instead, we're going to be using a mix of the heroic and prowess type keywords, including Valiant, which is something that is a little bit newer in Bloomborough, in order to punch through specific points of damage and then looking at our creatures not only with giant powers, but also dies effects in order to clear out our opponent's 20 or more life. The main goal of the deck is Bye -bye. similar to any aggro deck, Get your opponent's life total to zero as quickly as possible. Yay! But the Rakdos list looks to leverage a critical mass of low mana, single target pump spells in conjunction with a certain amount of equally as cheap, efficient creatures that will either benefit from the spells cast themselves or being targeted by them specifically. Let's look at the main threats of the deck, with the latest addition to the squad being first that really wants to be poked by your pump spells. Heartfire Hero. This unassuming 1-1 one, one for 1 boasts the quote-unquote fixed heroic mechanic Valiant, which triggers only the first time it's targeted in a turn rather than each time like its predecessor. When it's targeted this way, it gains a plus 1 plus 1 counter. When the mouse ends up kicking the bucket, it deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. You can already see that this is the hero that grows fast and is a threat that begs to be hit by removal quickly, but it will also deal some burn damage on its way out the door. Hitting it with a pump spell will give it an additional plus one plus one every turn, with at least two turn cycles getting it out of range of most burn based removal spells or sweepers. This card will also be a key component to the deck's quote unquote nut draw that we'll go over later on in the video, taking advantage of that dies trigger to deal additional damage that adds up quickly. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, there are still plenty of creatures to carry our spells in the deck. Slickshot Show Off has single handedly revived red aggressive decks in both Pioneer and Standard as a flying hasty threat that can evade hand disruption if you plot it ahead of time. What can basically be referred to as the glass cannon prowess ability, the bird wizard gets an additional power instead of toughness for every non-creature spell you cast with it in play, getting two power for the price of one. 
That means that these pump spells can easily give the bird five or more power on top of its starting one, quickly calculating death for its opponents. Bye -bye. The fact that it flies makes it a must remove threat as normal low drop creatures in Pioneer can't block it. Monastery Swift Spear is a longtime favorite of these style of spell slinging aggro decks and comes in clutch yet again as a traditional prowess threat in this specific deck. A hasty one drop that can quickly stack up damage, especially when there are pump spells involved, Swift Spear gives the deck a crucial extra must kill low drop threat to solidify the urgency an opponent must place in preserving their life total against this Rakdos deck. Now, Ember Heart Challenger is the second mouse in the deck and goes up the mana curve by one in order to gain a bunch of powerful abilities and some extra stat line. Haste and Prowess make this mousetary Swiss Spear of sorts, while a 2-2 body makes up for the point of damage for playing it a turn later than the Heartfire hero. However, the bonus to the mouse that makes it better than other Prowess options at 2 mana is the Valiant ability that it packs. Whenever you target it for the first time each turn, you get a mini impulse effect, exiling the top card of your library and allowing you to play it until the end of the turn. This pseudo card draw allows for chaining together a critical amount of spells and damage via said pump spells, while naturally spreading out your damage across threats on board so that a single removal spell doesn't kill a quote unquote Voltron creature completely stopping your plan. Flipping into more spells or even just more haste threats like more Swiss Spears can turn three open mana into 12 potential damage out of nowhere from a couple of pump spells and a Swiss Spear off the top. Now, Callus Cell Sword is the first black creature in the deck and also the first one that doesn't benefit from our spell package. Now, you might think that I'm crazy, but we're also probably never casting this card as its creature side. And if we are, we're probably losing the game already. So why the hell are we including this card in our list? Well, that's because Cell Sword has an adventure side, Burn Together, which is the cheapest fling effect we have outside of the card Thud. Now, not only does this spell not require sacrificing as part of the cost, which means it triggers our prowess, valiant, and glass cannon slickshot effects before needing to sack the creature, but it combines with cards like Heartfire Hero to basically fling the creature twice at an opponent. This 1-2 punch of damage is able to turn a 6 power mouse into 18 damage for a very small amount of mana and is the reason to be playing this version of the deck over any other combination of colors. Lastly, we have a creature that is making a resurgence for the first time in a while in the format, and that's Dreadhorde Arcanist. This is a creature that I absolutely love, and again, this is a creature that doesn't directly benefit from actually casting our spells, although Arcanist does play a nice role in the deck once we have those spells in the graveyard. Now with how cheap in mana cost our pump spell plan is, Arcanist is basically an aggressive snapcaster mage for any spell in our deck, allowing for cases where we can add six or more power to a creature, oftentimes for just one mana to cast the spell, and then again for free off of the Arcanist attack trigger. Arcanist is also a way we can attack our opponent's resources as the card pairs extremely well with the black disruptive spells that we'll see from our main deck and sideboard later on. Now those are the creatures you can expect to see out of most main decks in the Rakdos aggro list. However, there are more mouse dedicated lists that may run copies of Manifold Mouse. But this card has kind of fallen by the wayside in favor of Dreadhorde Arcanist as the Arcanist ability to bring back spells is relevant to all creature types in the list. However, some people may try to use Manifold Mouse to give their Heartfire Hero specifically double strike, allowing it to deal four times its power with a follow-up burn together in a single turn. Now there are another pair of creatures that have popped up a little more recently and skew the deck in a slightly different direction, which are the duo of Bomat Courier and Cacophony Scamp. 
Both cards play different roles for the deck, with Bomat Carrier's attack trigger stashing away cards for a refuel after going hellbent from pumping out damage. The fact that you can play around removal by just holding up a single mana in a deck with mostly 1 and 2 drop spells means you're not likely to lose out on the card advantage the construct can get you without like 2 for 1-ing your opponent in the process. Meanwhile, the Cacophony Scamp is a standard version port that provides a similar role to the Heartfire Hero, although it doesn't get the extra counter due to its lack of Valiant. However, the Scamp does offer a way to fling itself at opponents if it connects, pumping up our other Valiant creatures or anything else that has a counter on it as it leaves play. Now, the package of pump spells can vary between lists, but there are a core of two main spells that everybody agrees upon. Both Monstrous Rage and Titan Strength maximize the power you can get for your invested mana, giving giant growth type boosts to your creatures. Monstrous Rage provides not just the power boost, but a roll token granting a permanent buff as well as permanent trample, allowing you to set up a kill over top of blockers. Titan Strength, meanwhile, is able to provide a small scry effect that does help you fix the top of your deck, especially when you pair it with Ember Heart Challenger. Still under some speculation from the recent Duskworn set is a third type of this three power pump effect, Turn Inside Out. Although still pumping for three power, it doesn't do anything for the creature's toughness, which means that prowess creatures won't survive the extra three damage from a burn spell. It does, however, replace the creature via Manifest Dread, so we'll have to see if any copies of this card make it into the main deck of Rakdos in the future, because putting another threat face down on the battlefield or just replacing itself with a 2-2 creature we can target in combat later on isn't the worst rate for a one-drop spell. Cards that vary in quantity across lists include some other pump spells that provide a cantrip effect at the cost of some pure power. Ancestral Anger is a trampling stacking effect that pairs nicely with the more copies you can cast and could work well with Dreadhorde Arcanist to provide double its effect as well as drawing two cards. Might of Meek gives you the same trample ability that Anger does but will only pump up mouse creatures. The trade-off is that Might can be cast at instant speed, so adding power to a Heartfire hero or providing a second constant speed trample effect alongside Monstrous Rage is a tempting inclusion to decks. Kumano faces Kakazan makes the cut as not just a powerful red saga, but an additional creature after a few turns that still does things through your main plan of attack. The card itself triggers prowess and off slickshot show off, while its second chapter allows our smaller, hasty creatures to enter stronger and potentially survive damage-based removal spells. Reckless Rage and Fatal Push are the main deck choices of removal, although the decks usually prefer to run one of the two main deck with the other one or extra copies in the sideboard. Now, Fatal Push stands above all as potentially the best removal spell in the format, dealing with threats from Swiss Spear to Shieldred for the cost of one mana and if you can trigger Revolt. Meanwhile, Reckless Rage is a card that had a home mainly in Boros Heroic before coming over to the Rakdos version for many of the same reasons. The downside of dealing two damage to your own things is just offset by a prowess trigger that they can get, with prowess happening before the damage is dealt, so all your creatures with the keyword will survive, while four damage is able to kill creatures of various sizes in Pioneer. Even in the face of something larger like a Shieldred, lowering Shieldred's toughness to 1 allows any trample threats to maximize their damage on the way out the door. Now the last spell, and one of the core reasons to be Rakdos to begin with, is Claim Fame, an aftermath card with two main functions. The Claim side of things is basically an unearth, but only for creatures 2 mana or lower. Well, thankfully for us, that's every creature in our deck. This card was played a ton back when Lurus was still legal in the format, as the synergy with Lurus's Companion Clause was clear as day, and now for the first time in seemingly forever, Claim allows the deck extra reach by recurring threats from our graveyard for the low cost of just one mana. This also pairs extremely well with Dreadhorde Arcanist, as it allows us to bring back things that die ahead of our planned fling schedule. The aftermath part, Fame, which can be cast once the card is in our graveyard, is yet another pump spell to add to our existing arsenal that also grants haste just for two mana. 
Although most of our creatures come packing haste already, fame is yet another prowess trigger to amount to three extra damage to whatever creature we decide to cast it on, valiant trigger withstanding, and is great for pushing through lethal attackers if we play it after a low drop creature. Now, lands in the Rakdos aggro deck are pretty streamlined, although there are a few slight differences between deck lists. Now, at its core, we have a minimum of 12 copies of lands that can produce both red and black mana, namely Black Thief Cliffs for our early turns, Blood Crypt to shock in if we need to, and Sulphur Spring to painfully add the color of mana that we need. Blightstep Pathway can be played as a singleton or multiple of copies, but does have the downside of only producing one color of mana once it hits the battlefield. Den of the Bugbear is the sole creature land of the deck, providing extra tokens when it attacks, as well as a powerful three power body. Sokenzon as a free channel land in a pinch will give us two additional 1-1s to hold our spells, while acting as basically a mountain if we ever need to use it as a land. Speaking of mountains, up to two copies of Basic Mountain are the basics for the deck, as most of our spells are red outside of Claim and Fatal Push in the main deck, so we don't really need a Basic Swamp. Some number of Ramanump Ruins round out the usual suspects for the mana base, as it can in a pinch be thrown at our opponent for hopefully lethal damage. Now the big differences between the lists are mostly in the number of pathways, dens, and Ramanop ruins that get played, while the remaining slots can be used for copies of Rock Face Village. This Bloomborough Kindred Matters land only really works with our mouse creatures, but can both pump them up with an extra damage and grant haste, as well as trigger their valiant keywords if we're low on cards in hand. Although as I film this deck tech, Duxmorn hasn't hit the masses quite yet, Blazemire Verge looks appetizing for the deck, but due to making black mana when there are no other mountains or swamps in play, it's not great to have, especially in a one land hand. With only six of our lands having basic land types out of 20, I am not convinced that this is going to replace the pathways in the Rakdos aggro deck. Sideboards are a little bit different depending on your list, but can be broken down into three main categories. Disruption, hate cards, and the plan B pivots of threats for specific matchups where you'll need them. The dynamic duo of one drop black mana plays, Fatal Push and Thoughtseize, of course see play in the sideboard as a perfect way to disrupt your opponent's day with Fatal Push sometimes being main deck and the remaining copies resting here. Thoughtseize comes in against the grindier and control matches, as well as functions as a prowess triggering speed bump for control matchups. Additional copies of Reckless Rage can be found in the sideboard as well, with the number of them depending on which one mana removal spell you do see in the main deck. Chandra's Defeat is rising in popularity as another one mana way to deal with creatures from the mirror match all the way to Omnath, as it can deal 5 damage to a creature wearing red in its mana cost. Small upside is that it can tag things like Obnixilis and Crackling Drake as well. Similarly, Red Cap Melee deals 1 less damage overall, but hits a wider range of things and unlike Reckless Rage, just needs the land you tap to cast it to die in order to be cast on non-red things, not a creature. Feed the Swarm is being played because the deck as a whole has an incredibly hard time playing around enchantment based removal such as Chain of the Rocks, Leyline Binding, and especially Temporary Lockdown. While Claim can recur things from the graveyard, it can't grab our things from exile, so Feed the Swarm is the cheapest way to remove these game altering threats despite the hit to our life total. Rending Volley and Flowstone Infusion are the last one drop removal spells of sorts, with Rending Volley being more traditional removal and better in a metagame full of things like spirits and decks that are going to be packing counter magic to protect its threats. While Flowstone Infusion is played to mostly take down smaller creatures and smaller creature aggro decks, with the small upside of being a game winning pump spell on our own creatures in very specific scenarios. Unlicensed Hurst and Magebane Lizard are two of these specific hate cards you can play out of our sideboard, both for entirely different reasons though. Hearst is the quintessential colorless graveyard hate piece and pioneer, being a mainstay so long as you expect to encounter Phoenix or Sacrifice type lists. 
Meanwhile, Mange Bane Lizard can punish not only the Phoenix deck, but combo decks such as Lotus Field that are trying to race your clock with a fast combo of their own. Just be careful that you don't get yourself too low with your own Lizard against Phoenix, because all of a sudden they'll be coming screeching out of the graveyard and they can just kill you from basically nowhere if you've cast too many of your own pump spells in a single turn. Now, some lists will pack additional copies of Claim Fame in the sideboard to board in when their removal doesn't line up the best, and a matchup turns into a bit more of a grind fest, or you may need to bring back your creatures a few times after dealing as much damage as possible. Now you can keep these cards here if you think the main deck removal is stronger, but I am on the side that Claim Fame is solid enough to see mostly main deck play, and I would put them in the main deck in multiple copies. Lastly, there are a few Plan B type cards that occupy spots in our sideboard. Obnixilis the Adversary is a great threat against control decks, pressuring their hand and their life totals simultaneously. Ob makes the cut over Liliana, mostly thanks to the Casualty Clause, not only being a great way to sack cards like Heartfire Hero or Cacophony Scamp to get the fling effect of their own dies trigger, but it gets to copy itself and apply double pressure while doing so. There's also going to be a non-zero amount of times where you pump up a creature while your opponent can't react, and even though it doesn't kill them outright, it can be sacrificed to Obnixilist in order to immediately ultimate and deal 7 more damage to them. That should probably be enough. Hazaret the Fervent is the other threat from the board that hasn't seen play in quite some time, but I'm glad to see it coming back a little bit annoying to actually get rid of thanks to its god clause of indestructibility. Hazret thrives when you're playing on low hand count and can help push through the extra damage and not only in combat, but by flinging uncastable cards or extra lands at your opponent for kind of the only source of burn damage in the deck that isn't fling based on a dies trigger or a burn together actual fling. The way the Rakdos aggro deck plays out is going to be pretty fast and furious, as you're going to want to end the game quickly, yet calculated. The main thing to learn about the deck is going to be how to optimize your damage and calculating how much you can actually deal in a given situation. All right, sit down in your thinking chairs and let's think for a second. For an example, let's take a look at what is probably the nut draw for the Rakdos aggro deck. Now in our magical Christmas land of this scenario, we're going to assume our opponent doesn't interact much with us, which allows us to maximize our theoretical damage output. Turn one, we can play a Heartfire Hero and pass the turn. The following turn, we can play a second land and target the hero with a combination of Monstrous Rage and Titan Strength. This combo of spells adds a counter for Valiant and a roll token from the Rage. Then the power and toughness pumps from our two spells. So class, how big is our Heartfire Hero before we declare attacks? If you said an 8-4, that's correct! Swinging in will deal 8 damage while ending the turn, shrinks our mouse back down to a 3-3 thanks to our counter and roll token. If we untap and cast an additional Titan Strength, this puts our hero at an additional 4 power and 2 toughness with Valiant, meaning we can attack for 7 damage for a total of 15 combat damage across two turns. Any additional five damage of pump spells would kill, as well as casting the adventure side of Kala Cell Sword burn together, flinging our mouse for seven damage and dealing seven more thanks to the dies trigger. So in reality, we've done 21 damage this turn alone, so we don't even need to attack for eight on turn two. Yay. Now keeping that in mind, we can do things like Go back and cast Ember Heart Challenger and attack for just 3 damage on turn 2. Knowing that on turn 3 we plan to fling our Heartfire Hero, we can account for dealing damage equal to triple our Heartfire Hero's power. Not just double like we're used to by flinging other things. So a pump spell like Monstrous Rage will not only give us a counter on the hero and a trigger on the challenger for 5 combat damage, but if we cast that spell on the Heartfire Hero and get it up to 5 power for 8 total damage, we can then burn together our Heartfire Hero for 10 additional damage. 
That's 18 damage on turn three, plus three damage from turn two, carry the one, 21 total damage, a solid knockout. Yay. Now you're not always going to have the mice, but the rest of the deck is plenty adept at dealing damage through slinging spells and turning things sideways. If you notice, neither of our nut draws even had a slick shot show off in the mix. And this bird is definitely the word when you're playing three power pump spells. Slick shot off of plot or after an untap on turn three can be death in and of itself, as a pair of three power pump spells grant a total of 10 power to the slick shot show off, making a burn together lethal without a single other source of damage besides turning the bird sideways and throwing it at their face. Now your main struggles outside of taking a math class with the deck are going to revolve around your decisions on how to spread out your damage in the face of interaction and blockers. Hands with tons of instant speed pump spells are going to be a little bit easier to navigate than the situations where you have ancestral anger or fame in your graveyard instead. Trample is going to be a tool you utilize for maximum damage, even if it means losing the creature. And identifying when that is the case will be one of the harder aspects of playing the deck. Now, I've already alluded to being able to use removal spells like Reckless Rage to reduce a blocker's toughness to push through damage, while cards like Fatal Push can do the same against smaller blockers, as a trample attacker will still assign all of its damage to a player if the blocker is removed before damage is dealt. Now, playing fast isn't the only way to play the deck, and decks that apply early interaction like their own copies of Fatal Push or Spell Pierce for your pump spells against us will slow down our clock considerably. Being able to identify when an opponent may have those types of spells and being okay with committing to the board or only dealing a few points of damage here or there will be crucial for setting up your lethal attacking turns when you determine the coast is clear. Kumano plays well here as an early game play to raise the power of your creature the next turn and start applying some meaningful early game damage, then flipping into another good target for your pump spells after chapter 3. Remember that you can be a little expendable with your threats thanks to having claim in your deck, but do not overextend yourself, especially into exile based removal. Now, while there isn't a ton of data out there on the decks in head-to-head -head matchups due to just the lack of competitive tournament play and only really having winners metagame results from challenges and stuff on MTGO, the Prowess deck has quite the popularity due to its quick nature of gameplay, but I don't have hard numbers on its matchups. Instead, I'm going to base this off of my own interactions with the deck and what I've seen from watching other people play. Now, being an aggro deck, you can expect to have good matchups into a lot of these slower decks and more combo based matches. Lotus Field combo will be trying to race the deck, but the ability to take a turn off to Thought Seize while still chunking some targets of damage makes for an even better time than if you were the purely mono red version racing against the clock. You're also fast and furious enough to beat the iterations of Phoenix that don't have enough interaction for you, especially in game one. Oh, and Niftalite? Way too slow to stop you most of the time. Just make sure you don't get deafening clarioned. Decks that you're probably alright against, but may still lose some, are more of the mid-range decks that pack plenty of removal in a game plan to slow you down long enough to put out larger threats than your deck can really deal with. That means it's a family affair against the Rakdos mid-range decks, as variants in some of those decks draws can result in you winning quickly or grinding against the grain to maybe pull out a win or maybe slowly lose out. Similarly, the Jun Sacrifice deck might close enough of a stopgap due to life gain and blockers like Blood Tithe Harvester just to cat combo you out of the game, but this is where trampling over their sacrificed cat at instant speed really comes in handy. Go wide decks like Convoke that can either race or go bigger and taller than you could come down just to who maths better as well. Matches where you struggle are going to be the decks that can effectively and efficiently deal with your threats. In general, decks with exile based removal, mainly temporary lockdown, are going to be in this category. That means Azorius Control and even certain configurations of the Abzan Greasefane deck could lock you down and out of a game entirely. 
I'm also not a huge fan of the Slesnia Angels matchup, especially without things like rampaging Ferocidon or the new screaming nemesis in the sideboard to cut their life gain. We're great at dealing slightly more than 20, but 30 is definitely harder for us to hit. Now I've seen a lot of people comparing this style of deck to the old red black aggro deck around the time of Amonkhet, Dominaria, Standard, where you had Glorybringer at the top end, Hazard at the Fervent, so obviously there's some overlap in the cards that are in the deck. However, this deck doesn't necessarily play the same way, even though it does have a little bit of that recursion type thing that Scrap Heap Scrounger brought to the pile. Being able to use Claim Fame alongside a bunch of smaller creatures isn't quite the same as climbing up the curve to a giant dragon, but post sideboard, you do still have the availability to go up to that hazard level threat and then add a little bit of reach by just flinging even your hand at your opponent, not just your mice and your birds. So so while there is a little bit of overlap in the way those decks play, just because you played the old red-black aggro deck in that version of standard, don't think that the lines are going to be as similar because this deck is a little bit more intricate and nickel and dimey in how it wants to play since you don't have that giant dragon to fall back on. Now speaking of these intricacies and in how the deck winds up playing, Aggro decks in general, people kind of view as a little mindless and it doesn't take a lot of skill in order to kind of learn how to play the deck. And that's not entirely true. Now, I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that not everybody is going to be able to just turn things sideways and kill somebody in three or four turns because of the power level of the deck. However, there are lines of play that take a lot more practice to identify specifically in different matchups of the format. So while I think that playing, you know, maybe a handful of MTGO leagues or going to your LGS and playing a couple of FNMs over the course of a month will be enough to get you like 70%-ish of the way to knowing how the deck operates, the rest of it is really going to rely on your knowledge of the format and seeing where your windows of opportunity to execute what your deck is going to be doing, where those lie, when you can go for it, and this putting yourself in those situations more than just identifying where your opponent has given you the opportunity to do this. Now, because of that little bit of an increased learning curve, I'm going to say that this is more of like a medium level deck to really start to master. And obviously, as aggro players will tell you, it can become quite complicated as you get to the higher levels of play. So if you're thinking of taking this to the regional championship, do not just leave it up and say, this is my first or second day playing the deck, you probably want at least your week or two of testing beforehand to be completely dedicated to playing this deck just to figure out all those specific lines. So how does everybody feel about an aggro deck being near the top echelons of the metagame, specifically one that is using colors that the previous Rakdos deck already had, which was in the top seat of the metagame? Let me know down in the comments below if you've enjoyed throwing mice and birds at your opponent, or if you're sick and tired of getting all these little vermin and stuff thrown at your face in order to die. While you're down there, you can of course click the thumbs up button. I heard that it may wind up actually calling a exterminator to get rid of the rats and birds that may be flying at your face. As always, you can always tap that subscribe button to stay up to date on the latest deck techs, metagame analysis, and general magic content from me. Happy RCing!